Good evening, and, and thank you all for joining us on this very special SOAS centenary lecture event. I'm Christopher Kramer. I'm the professor of the political economy of development here at SOAS. And it's a pleasure for me, for us, to be welcoming the artist and social activist Forrest Whitaker here tonight. I know that all of you, all of us, are very, very much looking forward uh, to tonight's conversation. All of you, no doubt, are aware of Forrest's body of work. He's one of Hollywood's most accomplished and versatile figures. Um, in 2007, he received an Academy Award for Best Actor for his portrayal, which probably most of you have seen, of, of Ugandan dictator Idi Amin in The Last King of Scotland, a performance for which he also received a BAFTA Award, a SAG Award, and a, Glo a Golden Globe. You may well also remember him from Good Morning Vietnam, from Clint Eastwood's film about Charlie Parker, Bird, uh, from the Jim Jarmusch film Ghost Dog, or even as the voice of Ira in Where the Wild, Where the Wild Things Are. Forrest has also produced several award-winning documentaries that touch on a wide range of social issues. Through his production companies, significant others, uh, significant productions, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> significant productions. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and his other company, Junto Box Films, uh, Forrest aims to support young, talented filmmakers. His belief is that film can enlighten people across the globe and can start meaningful dialogues about important subjects. He's dedicated to cultivating young people's artistic talents, and as a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, he's working closely with schools to demonstrate the limitless power of the arts. Forrest is also founder and CEO of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, an organization that empowers young people in communities affected by violence to become forces for peace and voices for change. He's also co-founder and chair of the International Institute for Peace. He's UNESCO Special Envoy for Peace and Reconciliation and a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group. And tonight, he will be in conversation with the director of SOAS, Baroness Valerie Amos. Baroness Amos joined SOAS as director in September 2015. And before that, she served as Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Co Relief Coordinator at the UN. Their conversation this evening will focus on how youth in conflict-affected societies can be trained and equipped to transform their communities from within. And I'm sure you'll all agree that will no doubt be an interesting and very stimulating discussion. Now, before I move on, I'd also like to say a few words about SOAS's 100 years celebrations, as this evening's event is in celebration of our centenary year. First, I hope many of you saw, coming into the building today, SOAS's Brunei Gallery exhibition, Academics, Agents, and Activists, a history of SOAS from 1916 to 2016. The exhibition offers a fascinating insight into the history of the school from a very human perspective, and it highlights SOAS's wider impact on the world. Second, our centenary lecture series, of which this event forms a part, is also in recognition of our first 100 years. The series features lectures by high-profile guests speaking on subjects close to the SOAS mission. And next year, we'll be hosting the food writer and author Claudia Roden, Palestinian legislator Hanan Ashwawi, and human rights lawyer Hina Jilani. Our history and events such as this tonight in many ways demonstrate the important space that SOAS provides for debate, for discussion, and for asking the questions that matter. And that is why for our centenary year, SOAS has launched the Questions Worth Asking campaign so our students and academics can keep on asking and trying to answer today's most important questions. So, for example, we ask, is there a solution to the world's refugee crisis? 
What happens after war? Should we all be speaking the same language? What makes a global citizen? And will there ever be equality? It's true to say that for 100 years, we have been asking, searching questions, and through this campaign, we seek, to support, uh, we seek support to carry on doing this. We seek support for scholarships and student experience initiatives, for academic projects and endowed posts, and for transforming the SOAS estate. And you can all learn more about this campaign on the internet at soas.ac.uk forward slash questions. And please do all take a look. Now, finally, please could I ask you to have a look at these things, check your phones, turn them silent, but not necessarily off. And if you're tweeting, which uh, I'm meant to encourage you to do, uh, <laughs> please use the, uh, the, what's it called, the hashtag, hashtag SOAS, <laughs> hashtag SOAS 100. Okay, right. So, thank you very much. And I would now like to, uh, uh, to join you in hoping that we enjoy the rest of the evening's discussion and to welcome onto the stage Baroness Valerie Amos and Forrest Whitaker. Welcome to SOAS. Thank you. It's I great feel to be here. slightly jealous because I never get a cheer like that. <laughs> I mean, what is it I have to do? I don't know. You've done so much. <laughs> you know? But I, I'll cheer you now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Forrest, welcome again. It's really fantastic um, to have you here. And um, we're going to start off the conversation, then I'm going to uh, come to the audience uh, and take a couple of questions, and we'll talk some more. We have a hard finish at uh, 8 o'clock, so we'll do our best okay. to get through quite a lot of issues by then. And I wanted to start, um, I know the focus of our conversation is going to be very much around the work that you've been doing in countries like South Sudan, but I really wanted to start with America. Give, well, there's a certain election happening today that, you know. Um, you were born in Texas. You grew up in Los Angeles in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about what those places were like then and how they've changed? I was, I was born in, in Longview, Texas. My mom and my father, uh, they had actually moved to Los Angeles. And my mother would go back home to have her children, you know. Um, they left Longview, Texas, which is in East Texas, because there was very few opportunities. It was really difficult for people of color in that region. Uh, and my mother and father wanted to give an opportunity to their children and to themselves. Um, there was always a, a line in the city. It was the river. And they would say, those across the river. And at that time, on this side of the river would be the black community, and on that side of the river would be the white community. Um, my folks went back. I was born. I came back when I was about six weeks old to Los Angeles, to South Central LA. Um, I think Longview has shifted some, quite a bit. I mean, that, that disbursement of different people of different cultures is, is, is more, more apparent, uh, more clear. But there's still like under, undercurrents of the similar things that are going on. I remember particularly my, my I come from a, uh, actually I come from a family of teachers or, or preachers, you know? <laughs> and um, my, my aunt, she's a, she was a principal in school. And in the school, there was predominantly, it was an all black school, but there was one white kid there. And so they actually like bust him across, sent him away to another school far away. I remember my aunt like fighting this proposal and stuff and talking about it. And, but uh, that wasn't so far removed from where we are today. That was close, you know, I don't know, was it 10 or so years ago, you know? And so it's, it's different, but I went to LA and, and I, I was raised there. I don't want to keep talking too long. I can talk about Los Angeles and South Central as you, as you like. Please do. <laughs> we want to hear. 
No, I, um, my folks moved to uh, 49th Street in South Central LA. And uh, I guess, I know we were supposed to talk too about lessons in life. And I guess I learned a lot from my mom and dad because they made this journey. It was a big trip. They come from a family where, you know, you have land and you can put a trailer on it and your other relatives live there. And so for them to do that was a big lesson for me to think about facing your fear, but to try to strive for a better life. So they went to, they went to uh, South Central, and for them that was uh, an upgrade, you know, where they were. And um, I was raised amongst uh, a lot of changes. It was during the Civil Rights era, you know. Um, I touched some of that stuff because at the corner of my street, wherever I would walk, walk home, where the Black Panther office was around the corner, and they would pick me up and play with me during the day. And uh, I remember one of the big lessons I learned there too was one day I walked there and they weren't there and I went by their building and it had been blown up. It had been shot up and blown up. And as a little kid, it, uh, it changes your perspective some. You try to understand. So I was constantly trying to understand uh, my place and I was trying to understand conflict in a way. I think that's why I'm working in conflict now. I mean, I, the SLA was destroyed behind my grandmother's apartment. For some reason, that was like the zealot like effect where I was in these different places where things were going on. You know, um, and then the birth of the gangs, uh, the Crips and the Bloods, so I was constantly trying to, trying to understand that. And I was trying to search for something. One of the things, uh, I guess the lessons my mom told me was that she wanted me, well, she used to go to church on Sunday, and I would argue, why do I have to believe what you believe? And my mom would say, you don't have to. You can get up. You just got to find something to believe in, and you got to follow it. And I think those things were things that were kind of dictating some of the next movements in my life. Uh, and what's that something for you? Your mom said you have to find something to believe in. What's that something for you? I believe in connectivity. I believe that we're all connected in some way. You know, uh, I believe that in the annals of time at some point, we'll realize that we're all moving towards trying to be good and be in this space together. And I'm willing to try to be a part of connecting myself. And if someone wants to open the door for them to connect deeper to me and to others and to other things. So these last few weeks and months in the US where we've seen a lot of anger and a lot of hate unleashed, why do you think that's happened now? And what are your hopes and fears for your country going forward? I think that uh, the tinder underbelly has been exposed there was always problems of this nature. Uh, you talk about uh, some of the issues with the Black Lives Movement and Black Lives Matter and, and the death of you know, people of color and police officers who have been killed and all this stuff. Those things have been going on since, since I was a kid. You know? I mean, I, I know it. I've personally been touched by it by friends who have passed away from that type of thing. Um, I think it's, it's unfortunate that if there's some right now that seems to be some such like polarity between people and this break is making me a little concerned. Uh, people are talking about, you know, isms and, you know, about against uh, immigration, against, uh, you know, sexism and all these different things that are, that are about hatred and not about people coming together, you know? And uh, the country itself, I think in order to address issues that are already there, you have to see them. So I think, unfortunately, this has like, opened up a giant wound. You can see that people are, are unhappy. You, know, you can see that, you know, that people don't have their needs met. You can see that people are frightened for their own security. You know, uh, we have to address that. I mean, I've, I've been trying to 
address it in my way, you know, but I think that the country is about to go through something that I'm not quite sure. I think if you were looking at it, if I was looking at it, if I was in another country, certain places I've been, I would think, are they on the brink of a civil war? The breaks in ideology are so strong. Um, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Certainly we'll, we'll wake up and we'll have a new president. Uh, either case, unfortunately, we're just going to be a, a schism between the, you know, people. So we can talk more about it too as we go along. Very sobering. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Chris in, in the introduction talked a lot about all the different things that you do in your life and we'll come back to that. But you first went to university on a football scholarship. American uh, football. <laughs> American football. I can't play soccer too well. Not soccer as we know it. <laughs> yeah, football. <laughs> Uh, then you went back to your first love, classical music, right? Uh, and then uh, you ended up uh, acting. How did all that happen? Um, I was playing football, you know, and, and, I, and I, I showed some aptitude. I was pretty good at it, I guess. And I decided I wanted to go into the arts, or I was thinking about it uh, when I was graduating from high school to go to college. And I took a football scholarship to college to play, and it just wasn't working out right for me, you know. Um, I had been singing too, uh, so I got a, a scholarship to sing at University USC Music Conservatory. There, I was accepted into music program and had a scholarship to the acting program at the same time, and so I decided to switch. Um, I was only playing to be able to afford to go to college. I didn't really have the money to go, so I needed a scholarship, so that's what I did, you know. And, um, you know, they both taught me something. I mean, I think playing ball taught me a lot about, like, playing as a team, pushing myself to my limits, passing my limits, you know, uh, trying to reach a goal. I guess uh, singing, you know, it started me to move towards uh, the art that I do as an, art, as an actor, you know. So they both, like, led me to different things, yeah. I read in an interview, um, the interviewer said that uh, you've been described as inhabiting roles, not just playing them. Now, the film that we probably know most about, although I'm sure that people in the audience have seen many of your films, is Last King of Scotland. How did you manage to so fully embody the character of Idi Amin in that film? Well, uh, I think when I first started, I started studying the history. So I was trying to study the history of the man and what was going on in the region in, in, in East Africa. And I started to study Kiswahili because uh, I had this notion that I, I needed to feel like English was my second language. And so uh, I wanted it to be the first thing I would think of when I was about to say something. Um, and then um, I went to Uganda and I started doing interviews and meeting with people. I met his brothers and sisters. I went up to the area up there. Uh, I uh, met with ministers, uh, different people who had been dealing with him. I traveled and went down rivers that he went in and went into the mosque that he, that he used to pray in and just tried to acquire this understanding. You know, my assistants were, you know, the, the guy who was driving me around was really helpful in that. He was like giving me experiences, bringing me to go eat here, to go see this place, to go on riding through the streets on the back of motorcycles, you know. Um, all these things, and at a certain point when you keep hitting it and you keep allowing yourself to be open to it, something starts to happen energetically. You know, you surrender. I think in a, in a way you surrender to what, you're, what it is you're doing and you allow that to inhabit. Because I had this belief structure anyway that, you know, I, I, went, I went into acting because I, I thought it would help me understand my connection with others in the universe. So I felt like if you took away the different layers of a, of a, of a thing or a person, at the bottom of it was, was an energy or a light that connected me to everything. So I was searching to find inside of myself that molecule that would vibrate enough to become him, the part of me that was him. 
And so I was continually trying to do that. And, all, and I, I continued to do that work up until the last moment of the movie. Even when we were, I was continuing to do research, I would continue to go to different places, I would continue to try to understand. And I, I remember I asked uh, Daniel, I said, you know, what else, he said, what else can I do? You know, where else can I go? How else can I understand? And he said, uh, well, you haven't been to the reserve because I, I was more concerned with the people. And so then I went there. And it actually opened up something for me too to understand the beauty of the place, to understand the power of it. And I had seen videos of him talking about it. So to this crocodile saying hello and all these <laughs> different things. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a part of it. That's how the process went. Yeah. It was interesting when that film came out because so many people saw Idi Amin as a monster. And actually, you gave him a humanity and you made him likable to a certain extent. I, I, I still, I remember one time I had to do an interview while I was playing it, I mean, and, and I kept telling him, don't let me do an interview, don't let me do an interview because I, I have my belief structures in place around him, you know what I mean? But I think, I think that his deeds and his acts were, some of them were atrocious, you know, uh, horrific. But there are reasons that built him. The reasons that they made him become, they helped him become president. The reasons that he, he did brutality or expressed himself that way. And so I was looking to take away all those different things, whether it be his boxing, whether it be fighting the Mao Maos, whether it be, you know, his cabinet, whether it's the eleven groups around that's, you know, surrounding him that want to destroy him, until I got down to the bottom. And at the bottom of him, he's just like everybody else, you know, at the core. And then his experiences and his life and different things like that molded him into what he is. Doesn't mean that I agree with what he became. I just had a different point of view on who he was. Yeah. You, the, the members of the cast said that you stayed in character for three months and you scared the hell out of them. <laughs> was that deliberate? <laughs> no, I, I, I was I, 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 maybe deliberately um, uh, for me to make sure I could play the part. You know, uh, I remember one time I was. Uh, they had this. I had been working on him, and I had his his speech and his movement and stuff, and, and they had this uh, meeting in this hotel where they wanted the social gathering, you know, and I went down there and I had to like kind of drop some of that to try to do this, this meeting. And then when I left, I was like, oh my God, I've lost him, he's gone. You know, I, I couldn't find, I couldn't speak like him the way I thought, you know. Daniel kept saying, but you're wrong, he's, I can still hear you. I was like, no, I'm telling you, it's gone, you know. Uh, so I needed to do that in order to play the part, mm. you know, uh, was a requirement for me to be able to try to surrender to it. And you won an Oscar for that role. <laughs> mm -hmm. Only the fourth African-American ever to win an Oscar. Thank you. Were you conscious at that time that you were making history, you were part of this history, and did it feel like a very special moment? Uh, I guess it, it felt like really special. You know, I mean, I was electrified when it happened and when it, when it went on. I, I guess when I was uh, working on the part, I wasn't thinking that at all. I wasn't thinking about those kinds of things. You know, uh, I guess afterwards, when people like really speak about it in that way, then you start to recognize the, the true, maybe historical significance of what it is. Um, so that came as I went along, not as a goal in, in the beginning. My goal was just to be true to him and to be true to the time and the place and to tell the story. And then that's what happened from it. Yeah. We've talked a bit about you as an artist. I want to talk about you a bit now as a social activist. Um, you're very proud to describe yourself as uh, a social activist. Uh, you founded the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, uh, which does a lot of work in places like uh, South Sudan, uh, in Mexico and elsewhere. You're a UNESCO Special Envoy for Peace and Reconciliation. You're a member of the UN Secretary General's uh, advocacy group on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. You have a whole range of things that you do. You're also a director, you're a producer, 
uh, you support uh, young people coming through. How do you find the time? <laughs> I don't know if, I, if I've had that solved. You know, I've been lucky at times in my life where everything just fell into place, where it was meant to be, I guess, that I would be able to be at this event. And then during my work in South Africa, maybe I'm like mediating some conflicts that are going on from a conversation that I had before. But it aligned itself, uh, unfolded as naturally as it could. And I tried to, of course, with me trying to force pegs into holes and stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's, I'm, not, I'm always thinking that I, I don't have enough time and I'm not able to do things in the way that I really want to do them completely, you know, as fully as I should. But I try my best. Um, I wanted to quote you something that you said about... Uh, the work that you've been doing to try to stop the recruitment of child soldiers around uh, the world. Um, and you said, I first became really passionate about this issue a little over 10 years ago, this is at the time of the interview, when I was in Uganda shooting uh, the last King of Scotland. I, as a father, I was horrified to hear the stories of what these children had to endure. But I was also moved beyond words to see their resilience. Was this part of the motivation for you to, to form the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I think I started working with people in the states, gang members and different things, but I think when I met them and I realized that there was a connection in what was going on with them, uh, I wanted to see if there was something I could do. So I had started working with them um, First, we at Hope North, you know, in the north, in the north of uh, Uganda in Kirondongo, and uh, working with the students there and stuff, and working with the child soldiers that were there. And then it, it just grew from there, you know. I was very privileged to have the opportunity to travel with you to uh, South Sudan when I was uh, working at the United Nations. And uh, the depth of your knowledge and expertise, the number of times that you've uh, been to uh, the country, the way that you almost effaced yourself when you were with those uh, communities. I mean, really listening and hearing uh, what people uh, had to say. Um, there are many people that will set up foundations, they care about something, but not enough to be right there in the middle of it, actually doing the work. Um, what motivates you to spend so much of your time, given the other things that you're involved in and given that you have a successful career, to spend that time in the middle of South Sudan, two, three weeks at a time, working with young people? I mean, I think I recognize that uh, other, other people's pains are also mine, you know? Um, I've met them and you can't help but be motivated by, by the struggles. Um, I had an idea about how to do a sort of methodology that would hopefully work, and then we started to implement it, and that started to, 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 to work. We started to, to train them in conflict resolution and ICT computer technologies, you know, trauma skills and entrepreneurial skills, and, and I think working with them, because we're working with the community and they're guiding us, uh, I think I think I started to see the door opening for them to be able to to together with others resolve different issues just because we were allowing the tools to be available and um, so I, I felt an, an obligation in a way to try to be a part of what was going on there and many places that I've been and work in. And have you seen it made a, make a difference? I mean what's been the impact? Oh, well, the impact's been massive. I mean, uh, like we're in Eastern Equatorial State, we've trained, uh, we trained the youths there uh, in South Sudan during this conflict, during this war, and uh, they become the mediators for the state itself. Two of them have become members of parliament. Um, they have been um, mediating conflicts with the, the SPLA has uh, had their forces in schools, and they've went and mediated to get them out of school so that they can bring the children back, to be able to bring the environment back. Uh, they're building projects and developing projects. They're working together uh, to build roads. Uh, it's, it's, it's been, um, been quite impactful, uh, the work they're doing. 
so yeah. I'm going to bring the audience in for a couple of questions uh, right now. Oh, the hands are going up everywhere. So we have one here. Uh, have we got some mics? Yep. Thank you. Yep. Just along that row, there's a lady just... Yep. Thank you. Hello. Ah, yeah. there we go. Um, hi, thank you very much for being here and thank you for holding this, Soaz. Um, I saw you at the World Humanitarian Summit and it was a very pleasant surprise to, to get to hear you speak there. And my question is, um, do you see yourself as part of the African diaspora? And does this influence the work or the amount of work you do in Africa? Yeah, certainly, I, I consider myself part of the African diaspora. You know, I'm African-American. Um, and I consider myself a citizen of the world. You know? So, uh, yeah. And I, as far as influencing my work, I guess it was there when I first was working in, in, in Uganda where I got uh, my first feeling of, of, of Africa and understanding it and, and trying to let that seep into me to make me feel what that is. And, and that was an awakening. And I think it started the work that I was doing. And we're working there in Uganda and in South Sudan, South Africa. We also work in Mexico, and we also have programs in the United States, and so we have programs around the world. Yeah. Okay. This gentleman here. Okay. I can see there are other hands. Um, hi. Um, really lovely to have you here. Uh, my name is Ayo. Um, I'm really interested, actually, uh, as, as someone who's very famous and who's done some great films, how aware are the people that you work with of who you are? Um, behind the humanitarian and social activism and how hard or easy is it to break down those barriers um, so people actually understand that you're here to do something completely different? Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the community, the acting community, I don't think that a lot of people necessarily know the work I do. Um, I don't really, there's a big period of time where I just wanted to do the work quietly so that I can, you know, try to make it try to make it, uh, to see if it was successful, if it was really working before I would go out and even speak about it. And the only reason I would go out and speak about it is if the model was working that could help others to do other things. But for, for me, uh, no, they, I, don't, I don't think they're that aware. Was the question of, I think the question was about the oh. people. So for example, when you go to South Sudan, are the, are the people aware of who you are? Oh, and no. does that have an impact on how you're able to work with them? Yeah. Um, I would say in South Sudan and some many places I work, they don't know who I am at all. <laughs> they, they, they've, they don't necessarily, haven't seen any films, they haven't been to movies necessarily. We're working with, in like cattle, cattle, cattle areas, different places. Certainly the, some of the people on the political side uh, might know my work more specifically because I have to do you know, also advocacy, also policy level issues. Like, well, we spoke with the President Salva Kiir to speak to him about um, what was going on in the country. I spoke to him with children armed conflict to try to get them to sign a, a document that would allow the children, the child soldiers to be released. So I do have to, and I think in operating on that level, there are, I will meet more people that meet me than know who I am. But on the ground level, uh, probably not. No, not at all. And can I say that the way that Forrest behaves in those situations means that nobody would have any idea whatsoever. So um, it, was, it was great traveling with him. Um, I, I can see, I'm going to take you guys in the next round. I'm just going to deal with Dan here. There's a, a lady here. Thank you. I'm Dorcas Gwata, working in global health in Africa. Um, impressive um, philanthropic profile, which I don't think many people know, actually, so to hear this is impressive. I'm going to ask an unfair, unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, that means you don't have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there's a whole lot of debate around aid in Africa and our dependency on aid, and, and a lot of that budget will be coming from the U.S., um, and that's debatable on whether it's going to be cut um, here and there. I wonder what your views are on, on, on aid in Africa. And I say that because you're sitting next to Baroness, who herself has, yeah. a, has a, quite a world, a global profile. 
Um, hopefully, maybe Valerie will speak a little bit more about it too, because she's been dealing with humanitarian aid a lot. But I mean, she has. No, <laughs> I mean that's the question. But I'll, I'll answer part of it, and then you can. That was such a pause. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, you know, um, I think directed aid can be very helpful. I think that uh, m my limited experience, because she's much larger perspective uh, than me. Um, on a grassroots level, when you, when you specifically target uh, aid that allows people to acquire skills or to be able to, uh, um, to activate change in their own communities, I think it can be very effective. And in case of, like, say, like the, the health situation, I think training community health workers is very, can be very helpful. You know? and, and, and then it's, another, it's also a job that deals with the economy. It deals with you know, eradication of poverty. It deals with a lot of things. So I think that's very good. I think trying to like raise enough money sometimes to build certain facilities, those monies don't always get utilized in the way that we would like. Uh, but, uh, but certainly it's necessary. I mean, unfortunately, it's, pe it's people that are living in abject poverty at, at times in different places in the world, not just Africa, all over the world, Indonesia, everywhere, you know what I mean? And um, I think as human beings, we have, to, we have to try to lend a hand but I, for myself, the programs that I found in my program works most, specific, most specifically with the people themselves and, them, and giving tools that allows them to take control of what they want through education or through, you know, that's in my experience. Yeah, I think it's a very mixed picture. Um, you know, I've, uh, when I was at the UN and going to places like Sudan, for example, and seeing what was happening in camps like the Darb, where people had been there for years and years and years, uh, with no opportunities for employment or anything else, that this sense, it was keeping people in a sort of forced dependency, which I think uh, is highly problematic. Um, I also worry that uh, there are governments that uh, become uh, dependent uh, on the aid and aren't necessarily uh, managing or controlling how it's being spent um, in the sense of this is a priority of a government that is a donor, not a priority for a, uh, of the government uh, in terms of what the issues are in their country. Um, but like Forrest, I've also seen uh, people right at the grassroots level who have been able to you know, transform their communities, uh, particularly women, you know, when they're able to have access to some uh, resources. I think we need to um, learn a, a lot more lessons from the way that we have done aid in the past uh, and think about how we can uh, better utilise it um, in a way that brings positive, not negative benefits. But, I mean, there's an entire conversation that we could be having, uh, that we could be having um, about this. Um, I wanted to go back, if I may, to, um, to the work that you're doing with young people, because you're very much focused on working with uh, young women and uh, young men. Um, and it's not easy to find uh, models that, that work, particularly in terms of trying to prevent young people becoming sucked in to, to violence on on a large scale. Um, so what are the particular things that you feel that you've been able to do through uh, WPDI uh, that have made the difference and that you think others need to learn from? I, mean, I think a lot of people know, I mean, at the core of a lot of these things is like education, different things of that nature. But uh, in, in our case, it's by buying in with the communities and buying with the different power sources in, the, in, in that area. Um, training a, like, a group of individuals or working with people in that area that will, are willing to commit to going out and helping in others. So what we've done is we, we've trained, we trained a group of individuals. That group becomes trainers of trainers and they go back into the community. We chose to choose two from every single county and they've chose to choose two from every single village. And they go back into those places, working with them, creating peace uh, councils and uh, then going into development. Because I think the understanding of, 
of, of how to develop, uh, of, of creating jobs, of creating opportunities, is at the core of a lot of the solution, the problems. Um, when needs aren't met, then there's, there's conflict that's going to arrive. And so what we've done is uh, work with the, those communities, finance those projects, and those projects grow out as economic sources of income for the community and also uh, sources of pride and empowering those youths and individuals uh, to take control of those things and, and, and make, them, make, them, make them continue to grow. These are young people, so they go back into their village or community. I mean, how do they persuade the elders in that community to actually hear um, what they have to say and to actually understand that they have something to offer? Okay, uh, I think I've made a mistake because I didn't really describe all the, of the methodology. Um, initially, when we, before we even choose the youths, we have gone and we've talked to the elders, we've talked to uh, personality types, uh, economic sources, uh, the churches, the religious leaders, all these people become a part of a group that help us even choose the youths. So they're a part of the project from the very beginning. So as a result, uh, they, um, they, will, they help move the project forward. And once we've like, trained the, the individuals and they go back into their communities, they create another group of the people in their particular regions of elders and different people that work with them to be able to, to move forward so their voices can be heard. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's worked very well. The elders have brought them in to even mediate conflict. They brought them in to mediate the problem uh, of moving those kids out, the, the moving the SPLA out of the school, you know. Um, but they were already there was already a a, a buy-in, a com communal um, circle that surrounded the the actual work, and it, and it goes and it and and, th and that from there from on the outside, there's also another group that's supporting from a larger scale, from the outside scale. But this is the group that mainly mainly allows things to happen. And you've gone on record expressing disappointment um, with what has happened at the uh, leadership level in, in South Sudan. Um, the fact that you know, peace agreements have been signed and not uh, been adhered to. Um, what is your sense of what the future looks like um, for South Sudan and for these young people that you've been working with? South Sudan's been really difficult. I mean, there's been so many different peace agreements that have been overturned. And uh, I think uh, guys, you know, some of the conflict inside of, uh, you know, racial issues or tribal issues. Um, I do think, though, that the people themselves will have to fight forward towards a, a solution. Um, the outside. It hasn't worked. When you talk about aid and things of that nature, a lot of the organizations, a lot of the countries are pulling their aid out uh, to force the issue amongst the community to make the need, need clear so that they'll make a solution. Uh, I'm not sure that that deprivation is affecting the, the upper echelon of the political powers. It only affects mainly the people. And I think the people themselves are going to have to take a stance to uh, to step forward. Um, in, in, in terms of what we've been doing, we've been, uh, it's, things have gone really positively. Uh, we continue to grow. We have people coming to our learning centers. We, in the process of when they go into the villages, uh, different community learning centers are being built by us to allow access to the community for education and learning and to congregate. So those things have still been in place. Uh, People have been so respectful of them that they've left them intact even during this conflict. So, and again, I think that's because the people and the buy-in from the people and the people have to make the decision ultimately to say yes or no to what's going on politically in their country. That's very powerful because they leave it because it has come from the community themselves. Yeah. Uh, you talked about working in the United States as well. Um, what's the difference uh, between working in a place like South Sudan or Uganda or Mexico to working in the United States and working in your own country? I, mean, I think there's core issues uh, that are dealing with violence. We have violence, you know, um, we've had uh, violence in our schools where, you know, almost every day of the year there's a new 
point of violence in a school in the United States. And it's not publicized, but it is, you know. And so what we've done is uh, we started a program there to create a CRE or conflict resolution education to be infused inside of the core curriculum of schools. So when they're working uh, in classes, you know, conflict resolution training is inside of their math class, their history class, their English class, their science class. It's, it's a completely integrated to be able to start a dialogue, to be able to create uh, um, peer mediation groups and things of that nature. Uh, we're doing that in the middle school because we're trying to go uh, at a younger level so that it can help, uh, help when they move into high school. Uh, and we're planning on taking that model across uh, definitely the city and the state and hopefully the country uh, to try to affect violence in, in the country and the grassroots or seed level with the kids. And are you having the same impact um, in the US as you can see that you're having in somewhere like South Sudan? It's a new program, so I, you know, for, you know these, these programs, like, and like I can see it in the South Sudan clearly because it's been a number of years now. Mexico, you know, the youths that we train, they go into prisons and train uh, other youths to get ready for going back out into the world. Uh, um, they've uh, created like uh, all kinds of businesses in Uganda uh, where they train others. So I can see it, but in, in, I can only see that the, the, the responses to the lessons themselves at this point, because it's new, has been very powerful. And we've gotten a lot of feedback from the youth that it's really helping them in their school and being able to communicate and deal with things of that nature. Thank you. I'm take another round of, of questions, and I promise to go up here this time. So there's a gentleman here, and then there was a gentleman. Do you not want to ask your question any longer? Okay. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Whitaker. My name is Jay. I'm a PhD student here at Celeste First Year. I'm from, from Virginia, by the way. <laughs> I have a, a question. Have you I'm voted? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure I did. <laughs> you can ask Just... your question then. <laughs> it's a quick question. I'm studying the um, first Liberian Civil War the mechanics of the war, and there are a lot of child soldiers in that war in Sierra Leone. Just out of curiosity, um, would you ever consider working with child soldiers in that region? Uh, sure. I mean, we've worked, with, we've worked with child soldiers in Uganda and South Sudan. Actually, some of the, you know, like one of my favorite, this is uh, Simon, and he was a child soldier, and we worked with him for the last four years. And originally, he couldn't even be in a room, but now he has his own business, and he's training other youths to, like, start their businesses. So that was there, and we worked with child soldiers in South Sudan. So we'll be working with child soldiers probably next in Miramar, but we'll see. You know. And there's a gentleman along. Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, Baroness Amos. Um, but there's a job for you as an invigilator or an interviewer with the other, you know, task doesn't. Um, the other task falls, falls apart. Um, basically, the question I wanted to ask would, would, was actually to you, Baroness Amos, and I wanted to take the liberty of um, doing a two-prong question, for one for Mr. Whitaker also. For Baroness Amos, uh, as someone who's um, witnessed Mr. Whitaker's um, work on the ground in South Sudan, what would you describe as the component that he brings to, I guess, what is a team effort um, that you think is most valuable to that team effort for the... Um, uh, the, you know, what he's trying to accomplish. And um, for Mr. Whitaker, um, the burning question is that we've heard that you're in the cast of Black Panther. If that is so, <laughs> what role are you playing? Thank you. <laughs> so, so while you think about that, <laughs> I will just rattle off some words. So... Um, First of all, a huge amount of commitment, um, understanding. Um, I, I, I hope that what has come over this evening from Forrest is the, the depth of um, understanding and uh, reading. I mean, Forrest really delves into um, a situation to get an understanding of it. Um, enormous humanity and uh, a huge amount of compassion. Thank 
uh, Zuri. <laughs> it's a shamanic, uh, you know, aid to, to the panther. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was one, one gentleman there, and then I'll come down here. Thank you. Um, it's two parts as well. Uh, I know and that. What uh, is this? I mean, sorry. <laughs> uh, one one question. One question. I'll blend them together. <laughs> um, I know that you traced your your ancestry to uh, the Igbo ethnic group in Nigeria. Um, <laughs> and I I wondered what did making that connection mean for you for your kind of identity as an African American. Um, and how that kind of impacted your perspective. Uh, and the slightly second part of the question was... Um, completely lost control here. I, uh, I wonder what, uh, what your thoughts were on the kind of prison industrial complex in the US and the kind of impact that has on African-American communities, particularly kind of going off of Michelle Alexander's uh, recent work. Just a nice easy ball there. Sorry. <laughs> what was the one you said? Uh, the second one was um, the impact of... Um, Industrial, uh, industrialization and, uh, and prison, and particularly prison, oh, okay. on African American communities oh, in the okay. US. Sure. Um, and the first question, uh, uh, um, what was the first question? <laughs> oh, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> you see what happens when you ask a two part question? <laughs> It was, it, was the, it was the fact of your having thank had you. your DNA thank done. You. I, I, and I'm nervous, so. And uh, um, it's a very friendly audience. Um, it was very powerful to me uh, to understand where my origins were and where I came from. I think it's uh, very powerful to, to be able to recognize your ancestry and the ancestors that walk with you. And, and so uh, I think it shifted something inside of me that affects everything I do. You know? uh, I was fortunate. I know it's I was fortunate to get a chance to visit and spend some time, you know, with some of the some of the leaders there and different from different parts of the Igbo nation, and it was really powerful. Um, I think we have an extremely damaged uh, prison system. It's we have more prisoners than any place in the world. Um, it's unfortunate that they've created like certain laws that allow people to be incarcerated for even for their lifetime for what I would consider small crimes. And we have to figure out uh, how we can change this complex, as you say. Uh, we certainly have to change it with the laws. We certainly can't like allow some of the, I, I met people in prisons because I, I did a couple of documentaries in prisons. Uh, did one down in Angola prison in Louisiana. 90 something percent of the prisoners in that place will never ever leave, you know? Um, and some of them for crimes of selling, maybe, maybe they did or didn't sell drugs once or twice, or the, the, the evaluation of whether or not someone should be able to spend their entire lifetime behind bars and die. This actual uh, documentary that I did was actually about prisoners who care for prisoners. We don't even think about when aging prisoners are in the prison. You're like 70 years old inside of a prison, who cares for you? Then you got prisoners who are gonna be there for the rest of their lives, caring for them. Then we have to look at, you know, and see the humanity inside of that, that care. And then decide, should these people, should everyone be, should, should it be allowed for these people to be in there? And, should, and are our laws biased, culturally, racially? You know, and, and then we have to do that. I, you know, it's, it's a big question and it's a big problem in the United States. Okay, I'll take one here. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, my question's open to both of you. Um, earlier tonight you talked about inhabiting roles and it sounds like you've both been to some dark places. I'm curious how you get out from underneath the evil and violence and terror of conflict. Um, what are some mechanisms you use to protect yourself and I think the loved ones around you um, and hopefully extend the longevity of the good work that you seek to do? <laughs> uh, 
Well, you've been to so many places and been in so many conflict areas. So I think, uh, shit. Uh, thank you. Um, I think the first thing I would say, it's very hard. Um, so the thing that I realized when I left the UN, having spent five years doing this, was that I'd worried a lot about my staff and what they saw and making sure that they got counseling. And I never got any myself. Um, uh, so I left with this kind of huge weight uh, that I had to deal with. The thing that always keeps you going is the people that you meet. I mean, they are in the midst of having absolutely nothing. Uh, people are incredible in terms of the support that they give to each other, the way that they just come through these very difficult times. And that, that always just takes you through. Um, and the way that I protected family is a way that they didn't like, which is that I never talked about it. Um, I had a sort of schism between, uh, and I had, I had to do that because I couldn't bring all of this stuff into, um, into my other relationships. Uh, but it does make it difficult to travel between places where there's nothing and incredible inhumanity, and then to end up in, you know, basically in, in a supermarket with endless choice, for example. You just, it's very hard to, to deal with that disconnect. Hmm. Well, more, more I, I think it is difficult to try to resolve and clean yourself of that kind of pain. I think some of the UN workers that I've met, like, and, you know, um, they say that some of them are retired. They have like a, many of them die not so long after, you know. Uh, I think from the adrenaline, from chemically changing their body and their system as they go through like these different spaces and periods. So I think uh, for you, I mean, you've been so many amazing things and so many uh, powerful and ambitious things that it continues to move forward. So, uh, but for some, it's I think they haven't been, they're not able to, to cope with that and have to find a way, you know, to wash yourself of different things. I, you know, many of which, I mean, we're talking about, you go, you go to some place, we were in Way once, and you go there in the middle of nowhere, and like, you know this, you meet this guy who's like, you can see the tension that he has, and he's dropped, he's been dropped into this place with nothing but like a tent, to start a hospital and start a place where everybody can come to. In the middle of a place where there are no one. He just builds a tent and people start to show up. This guy's been living like this for months and he turns into a year and then all of a sudden, what does it mean? You know? You remember, you, you remember that? Yeah. And, uh, and he was relentlessly cheerful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. They used to hold their, their meetings under a tree um, and they slept in tents the sort of size of this table. But then when you compared that to what the people that they were working with were going through, then for them, you know, what they were doing was nothing compared to that. Uh, there was a, okay, there's a gentleman up here. There are two gentlemen here, and I think those have got to be the last two. Uh, oh, sorry, okay. So, <laughs> no, sorry. There, there's just one, so you, the gentleman behind you, and then one here, and that, and I have a final question. <laughs> So please. Uh, good evening. Thank you both uh, for tonight. Uh, my name's Kareem. I'm a master's student here. Um, we've seen some of the horrendous uh, images and videos coming out of the States towards um, people of color, particularly black men. Um, and my question would be, what lessons or message can the Black Lives Matter movement uh, teach us here in the UK or globally? And how does that relate to Africa? Thank you. I, mean, I think certainly uh, it teaches us that we have to speak up and when we see injustices again, we have to stand up and fight to change them and shift them. I think uh, there's still a connective tissue that still has to happen between all the different organizations that are working towards dealing with this goal. It's been happening uh, really honestly since I was a kid, you know. Now with social media, you're able to see things that you couldn't see before, you know. And, um, what does it teach you uh, in Africa or other places? Again, I think it's, it 
determination towards advocacy, a determination to, 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 to effectuate change, the, the courage that it takes to actually speak up and to stand up and to do something about something, to recognize that we each have the individual power to make a difference. Each person in this room could do unbelievable things that they choose to. And during that session of, of working, working on these losses of these deaths that happen, you know, to, to people of color, that, that uh, we recognize that we can step up, we can step in between, we can speak out, we can videotape. There's a million things that we can do, and they can do that in different ways around the world. You know? Okay, I'll take the, the gentleman behind you. And yes, I know, you're gonna, I'm gonna come to you. Yes. Um, this will be quick, my name's Mervyn. Um, really interesting talk tonight. Um, I'm just wondering how you, we could link with you over here, because we've got our issues in the inner cities, and uh, whether or not we could link in with your organization to do some, do some work with some of the, some of the gang members over here. How would, how would we go about doing something like that? Um, no, no, no. We're Gang open. members I'm, in quotes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm uh, we're open to, to discussing it. At one point, I think when there were some problems that we were, oh, we were witnessing were going on, we, we were thinking about uh, coming, coming in some way. But I think we also like to always partner with organizations on the ground. Uh, people who are working already to create a, a structure with us. Uh, if those organizations were to reach out to us or we would reach out to them if we made a decision to come here to see if there is a synergy between us to be able to do some work, and we would. Okay. Yeah. okay. Final question from the audience. It's coming. <laughs> it's your turn. And just in relation to that last question, um, you know, I think if you go on the website and look up the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, through that, make the links. Yeah? Okay. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Got there in the end. Um, my name's Sophie. I'm the Youth uh, Advocate and Engagement Officer Advisor for War Child UK. Um, yeah. <laughs> So a lot of the stuff that you've been talking about, uh, about engaging young people in conflict zones, that's a lot of what, what we're doing. Yeah, um, I've met with you guys in South Sudan. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, great. Uh, my question was related to the fact that people affected by conflict at the moment, um, children and youth represent 50% of that population of IDPs, of refugees, yet they are continually silenced. We don't really ever... It seems to be something that's not really um, acknowledged very much, that... Um, children and youth constitute such large numbers of these people that are affected, yet they don't really ever speak up about their experiences or get an opportunity to uh, voice their opinion on the services, the interventions, the humanitarian aid, the policy that affects them. So I was just curious, um, particularly thinking about the population bulge that we have in so many countries at the moment, if you, what your thoughts are on the kind of scalability of what you're trying to do and whether you've really kind of um, thought about pushing to make that something that's a bit more kind of standardized in approaches to this kind of work? Yeah, um, we have like a curriculum, you know, that we've been working with and a methodology that we feel works. And we're just now like discussing, after we've seen like some of the, the movement, some of the things happening, um, how we're gonna be able to scale. Um, we have a lot of great workers, you know, uh, in the field that have helped us with that. Um, and we'll be, we'll be doing that. You'll see more of it coming. I think the next thing that we're gonna be doing is a, is a refugee camp in, in, um, in Uganda, there in uh, Kiryan Longo. Uh, but, uh, you know, the scalability of it is, is based on like uh, funds as well. I think if we are able to acquire the funds to be able to scale out, then we will. Uh, we were talking about that with uh, uh, Carolyn just completed earlier today and talked to uh, Dagu in the field about it and a lot of our people have been working on it and I was on calls about it all day today. Uh, but you're right, 60 million people are out of their homes, 30 million are kids, you know, 20 or some odd million of them are refugees, 10 million of those are still, so it's a, it's a major, major problem. 
you know, and we're hoping that by scaling, when, as we raise more money, uh, we'll be able to be a part of the solution with people like your organization and stuff. You know? yeah. um, Forrest, I wanted to ask you one last question. You've been incredibly generous um, with your time. Um, one of the things that you said in the past, and I'll, I'll quote it, is you said, if there is inequality and that equates with colour, then I'm going to deal with it. So my final question to you is, what would you like your legacy to be? I would like to leave a legacy that uh, concerns connecting with other individuals, uh, making and filling this world uh, with a, a space for people to have a decent life, to speak about those things, to illuminate those things, to illuminate the connection between those things. Uh, and that way, uh, to, truly, to truly be a part of, of humanity's movement towards uh, oneness. I know it's abstract, you want it to be more, <laughs> more like, uh, you know, but the, the fact is that I, I want to, and I'm hoping to leave a mark that just means that I was involved with everyone, moving towards human race, towards a better humanity. body of work, um, both as an artist and as a social activist. You've allowed us a glimpse into some of that tonight. Um, and for that, we thank you very much indeed. And I don't think that one round of applause was nearly enough. <laughs> so we're going to give you another. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.